happy. So I, I, I supported Remain um, quite adamantly. Uh, I didn't trust the Tories. I still don't um, at all. I ended up writing an entire book about why um, the Leave campaign had been an exploitation of divisions in, in British society in order to usher in a very, very extreme free market neoliberal Brexit, basically. Um, and that's not what the people, I believe, voted for. Um, in any way, shape, or form, but uh, like I believe that that is at least what the Tories are going to try and give us. But at the same time, there's, there's, I, I, I can't gra- grasp why, why, why the mo, the majority that I have seen, at least anyway, like this, this is just my personal thought that they can't accept that there could be benefits. Like I, I wrote the whole book and kind of changed my mind on the EU a bit and decided that. In the in the the grand scheme of things, it was probably better not to be like inherently linked to that institution. And then I have tried to say this to to remainers and be like, look, you know, we we lost the argument. People have voted. We have left the EU. Let's try and take advantage of whatever like benefits we can. Like for example, as someone on the left, I hated the fact that the EU state aid rules meant that there was like certain industries we couldn't help, especially yeah. green industries. Um, I like for there's been a great example of things that we could do now in um, a British company who is who has bought and is setting up solar farms in Morocco with a huge cable from Morocco the whole way to the UK. This is the proposal, at least anyway, that could right. supply like eight or nine percent of the UK's power. And it's like that wouldn't have been possible in the EU. Isn't that a good thing? But the the, yeah. the blinders are like, why do you think that people can't accept that? Like, I, do, I still don't want to have left the EU, but now that it's mm. happened, like, I want to try and, like, take advantage of whatever we can, but why can't people, like, think, okay, you know, it's happened now, like, let's, let's do something good with it. I mean, again, that's a, co- it's a complex question, and uh, I'm actually just finishing up a, a book with some of the, some of the guys from the, the full Brexit, um, which will address some of these questions. Um, but, I mean, there's many ways one could answer that question. One is just on a kind of psychological basis. All the evidence shows that once you make a decision, your mind re- reorders itself behind that decision. Uh, because we can't deal with cognitive dissonance. You know, if we're facing a difficult decision, uh, we have reasons for and reasons against. Once we make a decision, we don't like the idea that we might be wrong. Hmm. So what we tend to do is reorder our mental uh, cognition behind the decision that we've already made. So if we buy an expensive car that we probably shouldn't have bought, we make excuses about, you know, well, oh, this BMW is the safest, it, you know, it's the best for the family or whatever, all these kinds of things. Uh, so, you know, social psychology would predict that once you've made a decision, you're not apt to change your mind, you're more likely to double down behind it. Um, and I think that is what happened on both sides. And those kind of leave and remain associations became almost an identity. Uh, and their associate, people's associations with leave and remain were much, much stronger than their association with individual political parties, which are now quite weak for reasons I, we talked about at the top of the show. Uh, but I think it goes a lot deeper than that. Um, you know, a lot of people had uh, they decided that no good could come of Brexit and they get, so they're kind of sticking with that position. And there's kind of a couple of reasons for that. One is kind of flawed understanding of what the European Union is and, and how it relates to democratic politics. And the second is, you know, specific relationship to, to the government, to the current government. You don't trust the Tories, you don't like the Tories, uh, the Tories are up to no good, et cetera, et cetera. So on the first point, what, you know, what is the EU? Neither side really understands it. It's the truth of it. So the, the conservative right, the Eurosceptics and populists see the EU as some kind of like foreign imposition, you know, Brussels bureaucrats kind of bossing us around, which is not true. The most powerful institution in the EU is the Council of Ministers, uh, which comprises elected national officials. It's not the Commission. Um, and the commission only has about 20,000 people working for it anyway, which is just the size of the BBC. So the, the idea that these 20,000 people somehow run Europe is just, it's, it's, 
this beggar's belief that that's not right. But equally, the left's idea of the, of the EU is this sort of cosmopolitan zone of peace and cooperation that sort of locks in social protections. Uh, this is also just completely wrong. Um, it, it's, not a, it's not a peace project. Um, it has actually fermented in recent years big divisions between North and South Europe, for example. Um, that is a direct result of the, uh, the, the Eurozone and the way that it is constructed. Just look at what's happening with the so-called migrant crisis in the border of Belarus. You know, you've got so-called free movement inside and fortress Europe outside. You know, tens of thousands of people have been, have been killed trying to get into Europe and those people have been securitized and others by, by, by Europe in what is basically a racist immigration regime. And it's okay for mostly white workers to move around within Europe. But anybody that wants to come from outside, well, no, you can get lost. Um, you know, so the idea that sort of racism is the sole property of, of, of leave voters has often been suggested is obviously not right either. Um, I mean, Zuby, yeah. Zuby told me when I uh, talked to him about this on his show yeah. that he thought that the Remain voters were the racists because um, they that they have the the racism of low expectations. And there was a couple of other things he said to me. I can't remember, but I had it was really interesting to me for him to say that. And then we talked about that something I discovered in writing my book in that Britain is one of, if not the most diverse and accepting society in europe like yeah. we we are the most accepting of people of other races compared to like any other european country that's france austria yeah. uh, like they're they're all pretty racist like there they, there is no like europe isn't this like wonderful utopia where people aren't aren't racist you know I, no, I've, I've witnessed it i'm afraid it's not and you are right that's i mean it's very difficult to measure racism right it's very difficult uh, but there are various ways that people have tried to do it through opinion polling, for example. But the opinion polls are very consistent, doesn't matter what kind of questions you ask. Uh, Britain is very liberal on questions of uh, racial integration, uh, and it's been getting more liberal uh, over time. The, and the direction is, is unilinear, it just goes in one direction, and it's more progressive than almost any society on earth. Um, it doesn't say we don't have problems, but that's what the evidence shows. In terms of people's behaviour, it's the same. You know, uh, overt discrimination in the workplace has been abolished for a long time. Discrimination in the provision of public services hardly exists. Um, you know, despite all the talk about a wave of hate crime, actually, if you look at convictions for, um, you know, racially aggravated offences and things like that, they're low and flat. Um, all, all across the, the piece, when you look at any kind of evidence, you know, support for far-right political parties is tiny compared to um, other EU countries. You know, it's not this country where a far-right uh, party comes second in every presidential election. It's France. It's not this country where you have far-right populists in power. It's, it's Austria. You know, it's Poland. It's Hungary. It's Italy. It's the way that people think about the UK is just totally divorced from reality. And so it's the flip side of that, what um, the German sociologist Wolfgang Strait calls the sacralization of the European Union. That what, what the EU really is, is a neoliberal constitution for Europe. And this is why Margaret Thatcher was such a fan of the, of the EU and the single market. The whole idea is to, is to take market mechanisms and entrench them at the level of European law so that you can't touch the market. So we have the integration of markets for goods, services, um, capital, and workers, right? That's what so-called free movement is. It's the integration of European labor markets. Mm -hmm. But it's turned into this, uh, oh, we're so liberal, we're so accepting, we're so cosmopolitan, we're so anti-racist. It's a great example of how something that's really about integrating labor markets so that people can move around and the fact that and factors of production can be efficiently allocated across the european market which that's not sexy that's not progressive that's not nice that's just neoliberal and it often has very horrible consequences including for the people that move right because what it's basically saying to you like uh uh the conservative government used to say to people in the north in the 1980s here, they used to say, get on your bike and find work. 
just move to where the work is. Well, that's what we're saying now to people at the European level. Oh, no work in the deindustrialized parts of Eastern Europe. Oh, let's go somewhere else. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment for us in the comments below. Let me know what you thought and if you'd like to see more of this from the show. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time.